Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. It's wonderful to be back in Scottsdale Thunderbird again. Uh, I just appreciate so much the graciousness of Pastor Dave uh, in inviting me to take part in this wonderful service. And uh, I say gracious, I mean gracious, because I'm the one that got us into this debt in the first place. So. <laughs> but Pastor Dave, you, you came along and you finished strong, and God bless you, brother. God bless you. I appreciate my brothers here, Reggie and Jeff. You're the man. Um, there's a few here that, a few that aren't here that I wish were still. Uh, we miss Sister Claudine. We miss Sister Carol. Uh, but it's so good to see uh, our Cape Creek folk here. God bless you guys. I'll have to apologize to Bobby later uh, for, for you guys skipping out on him. <laughs> um, the Bible says, uh, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Amen. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm shaking. I'm nervous. I don't know why. I can't see if I can settle down here. I have a few pictures that I found uh, in my stash of, of pictures. We were so excited uh, when we started, actually started building. I remember uh, Brother George, um, it, I think we were 150 to $175,000 down before we ever even turned any dirt with all the, uh, the permits and things like that that, that, uh, that were involved in building in the city of Scottsdale. And I remember thinking, uh, uh, as, as the bills kept going and, and we weren't even really seeing any action. We'd spent all this money and I was like, oh my goodness, what have we done? What have I done? And, uh, but, but God came through in a big way and continues to come through in a big way. So uh, I'll just show you a few of these. These are exciting. Uh, in, uh, in this picture on the, on the far left, on my, my left, your right, you'll see a young uh, Zach Suravec, uh, who is now the associate pastor at Glendale uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church, so uh, I'd like to think I had a small part in, in uh, bringing that young man along in the ministry as well. Uh, here's some uh, my favorite Bible verse that, that the students put right up above the, uh, the doors over there, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You know it well. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. And we truly believe that God was directing our path. Uh, and if we didn't, uh, we were in big trouble. Uh, there are some names uh, on the wall that you might know, Oliver and Arlene Murata, uh, dear friends of Thunderbird Academy for many, many years. Uh, that was the first pew to go in. It's the, it's the one that you guys are sitting in the back, all the way in the back. Uh, Bob Thacker and Ellie, you guys are back in the, uh, <laughs> in the first pew that, uh, that went in. We all put together, uh, we, we didn't have a lot of money, uh, so they brought the, brought the pew parts and stacked them in here, and all the church came, and we put the pews together and had a, had a fun time doing it. Uh, there's Dr. Herber that we couldn't keep off ladders. Uh, Kelly Sue was constantly trying to get him off the ladder because she said, Dad, you're going to fall. Dad, you're going to fall. And uh, we'd turn around, and there he'd be up the ladder again. So uh, This was our first Christmas, and uh, uh, you'll see the Christmas tree is there, and, and uh, I, I just always have loved this picture because it just, it just reminds me of, of Thunderbird as our home, and uh, so, so I, I appreciate this picture very much. All of you that, that have uh, had a part in this, uh, uh, that you've walked, uh, I see the Clarks back there, God bless you guys, the Heisies, dear friends, um, so many, so many that have sacrificed and made this this uh, moment possible, and I just want to give you my heartfelt thanks. Uh, but first of all, we want to thank the Lord, shall we? So let's bow our heads and, and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you have, have made happen. As, as we sang uh, this morning, to God be the glory, great things he has done, and great things he continues to do. And uh, so we give you all our thanks and praise, and we humbly... Uh, ask for your presence. We ask for your spirit, Lord. Sanctify this place that was built in your honor and uh, sanctify our hearts, Lord, for we live for you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. My uh, text for today is, uh, 
is Hebrews chapter 11, 39 and 40. And it says, all these, all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us. I always like that phrase, something better. Everybody's always looking for something better, aren't they? They're looking for something better in advertisement, you know, something new and improved. But God is the only one that can truly give us something better. And if you don't remember anything else today, remember that whether God restores something you have lost or whether God blesses you with something that you have, God always has something better in mind for you. In uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 34, is, uh, the story of one of my favorite heroes, uh, his, the end of his story. It says, Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead, as far as Dan, all Naphtali, all the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah, as far as the western sea, the south, the plain of the valley of Jericho, and the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar. Moses got to see all of that. He got to look at it. God gave him special vision to be able to see all of these things. And then the Lord said to him, this is the land which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. What a downer story, isn't it? <laughs> what a... Oh my, after all that he'd done, after all that Moses had done, after, after the blood, sweat, and tears that he had put into, into these people, these people that had turned on him every chance that they got, these people that had complained and murmured and rebelled their way across the, the desert, now they're, they're on the edge of the land and what Moses wanted most was to be able to walk with these, this group of people across into the promised land. And God said no. God said no. You shall not. And here's what I want you to remember. When God takes something away from you, He always replaces it with something better. When God Remove something from your life, something that was dear to you, something that, that, was, that was precious to your heart, something that you had sweat, blood, and tears over. If God chooses to take that away, you may think it's cruel, but brothers and sisters, God has something better in mind for you. Here's a church in uh, Maui. We have about 30 churches on the, on the different islands of Hawaii. And some of you have been, have been to this beautiful little church in Lahaina on, in Maui. It's along the seashore. The beautiful little town of Lahaina is a historic town. And uh, of, uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, a fire came through and, and burned it to the ground. Uh, and there is our, uh, you may recognize this guy. Uh, his name is Eric Vandenberg. Uh, some of you know Eric and love Eric, and there he is uh, standing with his uh, protective equipment on his, on him, uh, standing where we used to have the fellowship hall of the, uh, of the, Mal the Lahaina Seventh-day Adventist Church. There it is, uh, burned to the ground. Uh, th this was the place where they had their, their uh, potlucks, and just to the right of it, in the back corner, you can see where, where the, uh, the uh, parsonage was that the pastor would stay in. We praise God that nobody was injured or killed in, in, uh, at, from our church there, but as you know, many were, uh, were hurt and, and many killed. The Lahaina church, God took, took stuff away from them. There were tears, there was heartache, there was sorrow. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters, there is courage and there is faith in the heart of the Lahaina members now because they know that when God takes something away, he replaces it with something better. And we don't know what that is yet. But God has something in mind, and we know it's going to be great. We know it's going to be great. And it just struck me as, as we're here celebrating this, this, this structure that, that God gave to us. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. But what do we say? Let's say it together. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The good news is that God gives us 
something better when he takes something away. All that sin has taken. How much has sin taken away from us as human beings? How much has, has sin taken away the, the innocence and the, and the, the joy and the, and the happiness and the, and the contentment? We don't see much of that anymore because sin has taken it away. But brothers and sisters, when God allows something to be taken away, He always has a plan to restore it. And His plan to restore it is even better than it, than it was before. I'm looking forward to Jesus coming. I'm looking forward to the new earth because God is going to make it better than it was before. And all that sin has taken, the gospel restores to us through Jesus Christ. And that's the good news. 1 Corinthians 2.9 As it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor has entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. As beautiful this place is, God has prepared something so wonderful, so amazing for His family, for His children together, together that we can't even imagine how great it's going to be. We can't even imagine. Jesus said, say it with me, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also. I keep seeing that word prepare, prepare, prepare. God has been preparing a place for you and for me for all these many years and He is looking so forward to the time when we can gather in that great convocation in heaven and, and worship together as the family of God. Paul tells us we're to set our mind on those kind of things. When we lose, when we gain, it doesn't matter. We're to set our mind on Christ. For if you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. You know, Ben George was a pastor here back in the day. I was When I was a baby pastor, I came out and worked with him at the Glendale Church as his intern. And he had a saying... He always used to say, uh, when somebody said, look at that beautiful church or look at that beautiful building, he would say, future ashes, brother, future ashes. <laughs> as beautiful as this church is, Pastor Dave, it's future ashes. When Jesus comes again, may that day be soon, amen? It's future ashes. Our citizenship where? It's in heaven. It's not here. We don't belong here. We're pilgrims. We're strangers. We're just passing through like the old song says. When we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, how many of you are eagerly waiting for Jesus to come? Eagerly waiting. Longing. I love this passage. A little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. Remember that old song, Because He Lives? I can face tomorrow because he lives, all fear is gone. Came from this text. Came from this text. Jesus living is our guarantee that we will live. Even if we go to sleep in Jesus, we will live again with him eternally. It's good news because he lives. What does Jesus want the most? My friends, what does Jesus want the most? If you go to John chapter 17, right before uh, the crucifixion, right before he went to, through Calvary, went through Gethsemane and goes to Calvary. Jesus prays his prayer. The last words of a dying man. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. It's the last thing Jesus asked his father for before he went to the cross. That's what he wants the most. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Father, I desire they who also you have gave me may be with me where I am. That's what Jesus wants the most. He wants you and him to be together throughout all eternity, never to part again. That's what he wants the most. It's something better than worshiping. I know we worship by faith. We feel the presence of the Holy Spirit, but even Jesus wants the face-to-face -face experience with his children that we're going to have one day soon. Something better, my friends. Something better. Revelation 21 tells us that, that Jesus will get that prayer. We know that because we read the end of the book. We know the end of the story, right? 
where the loud voice from heaven is heard saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Finally, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Finally, human beings that I desire more than anything else to dwell with, to be with. Finally, we're together. And this loud voice comes from heaven. Jesus Himself saying, Behold, finally, the dwelling place of God is with men. And He will dwell with them. And they shall be His people. God Himself will be with them and be their God. With them. With them. With them. Three times it's mentioned how desperately the the heavenly family wants to be reunited with the earthly family. Because there's something better in mind for us. Something better God has in mind for us. So no matter how bad this life gets, no matter how good this life gets, my friends, we cannot forget that God has something better in mind for us. Let's go back to our good friend Moses. There he is, having desperately wanted to lead his people. Do you mean, by the way, do you remember why he's up there alone with God dying on the side of a mountain instead of crossing over. It was this little experience that had to do with water in the desert. You remember the story. Uh, This was the second time this had happened. They'd come to this rock before. God had said, take the rod, strike the rock. Water comes out out of the rock. It was a beautiful object lesson. It was an object lesson because that rock represented Christ. When Moses struck the rock, it represented Jesus giving His life for all humanity. And what flowed from Jesus was grace and forgiveness and love and mercy but flowed from His wounds on the cross. But but that that rock in the desert represented Jesus Christ as the the grace and the mercy and the love of God flowed from from, from Jesus Christ. The water flowed from the rock and the people drank of it. Sometime later, they came, to another, they came to the rock. I don't know if it's the same rock or not. It's a rock. And again, the people are saying, and if you can read this story, and it's a sad story. It's in Numbers chapter 20. And, uh, and uh, uh, they come to the rock again. The children of Israel are complaining, why, Moses, have you let us out here? And Moses loses it. <laughs> That's all the, the only way I can describe it is he loses it. He is so angry. And God said, Moses, Moses, chill, bro. (laughs) I need you to go speak to the rock. And I'm going to make water come out of the rock, uh, but I want you to speak to it. A beautiful object lesson, right? Now what do we do when we want grace, when we want mercy, when we want forgiveness? We go and we kneel at the foot of the cross and we cry out to Jesus, Lord, save me. Lord, forgive me. Lord, bless me. And blessing flows from God in response to our prayers. Amen? Another beautiful object lesson for the children of Israel. And what does Moses do? The Bible says he comes out, he has his staff in his hand. You know, it's probably better not to carry a weapon when you're really angry. But he has a staff in his hand and he, he, he looks out at the people and he just loses it. And he says, hear now, you rebels. Hear now, you listen to me, you bunch of recalcitrant teenagers. You bunch of juvenile delinquents. You bunch of, of, of rebellious people that, that don't know what good when you have it. Here, must I bring water from this rock for you? And he smacks the rock with a stick again. And water flows from the rock. Because God is gracious even when we lose our temper. But then God says, Moses, because you ruined an object lesson of salvation, because you ruined a a lesson that I wanted to teach people about, about Jesus and the cross and about prayer, because you ruined that, you can't go. And the Bible says that Moses pled with God. He pled with Him over and over again. Finally says, God says, Moses, We're not going to talk about this anymore. You're not going. And at the end of Moses' life, he climbs up to that that hill. He goes uh, to that place and God opens his mind in a miraculous supernatural vision. He opens it to see everything that he was going to miss. And it feels kind of like God is just rubbing it in. Look at here, Moses. Look at how beautiful this is that you can't go. 
Look at here, Moses. Look at, look at what you're missing. Look at, look at this beautiful place. Look at these trees. Look at these grapes the size of basketballs. But you're going to miss it all. And it kind of feels like God is rubbing it in just a little bit. This is the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. What is the principle for today? When God takes something away, He always restores something better. Now here's what Moses saw in his vision. He saw Canaan settled. He saw God showed him a vision of time, not only of real estate, but he showed him the stream of time down through the centuries. Canaan settled the history of apostasy, the first destruction of Jerusalem. Moses saw the birth of Jesus. He saw the crucifixion and the resurrection. He saw the history of the church. He saw the last days. He saw us gathered here at Scottsdale Thunderbird Church celebrating the paying off of our mortgages. Moses saw all that. He saw the faithful people at the end of time who were hanging on to Jesus with all their hearts and with all their souls and with all their mind and with all their strength. He sees the second coming of Jesus. He sees all this in vision. But that's not all. What else did Moses see? When we look in the book Patriarchs and Prophets, it says this, still another scene opens to his view. The earth, freed from the curse. Listen, lovelier than the fair land of promise so lately spread out before him. Better than the land of promise so lately spread out before him. There is no sin and death can't enter. There the nations of the saved find their eternal home. With joy unutterable, Moses looks upon the scene, the fulfillment of a more glorious deliverance than his brightest hopes had ever pictured. When God takes something away, He gives you back something better. The next time we see Moses, he's... He's with Elijah. They're on the Mount of Transfiguration. They're encouraging Jesus Christ. They're, they're giving Jesus encouragement and hope and faith and saying it'll be worth it. It'll be worth it. Jesus, when you go to the cross, it'll be worth it. That's the next time we see Moses. The next time we see Moses, we'll be sit, standing on the sea of glass singing, Hallelujah, heaven was cheap enough. Heaven was cheap enough. Brothers and sisters, when God takes something away, He replaces it with something better. All these died in faith. Moses died in faith, brothers and sisters. Moses died in faith. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, but now they desire a better that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. Have you read this lately? God has a purpose in sending trial to His children. He never leads them otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning. That takes some faith sometimes to believe that. When God takes something away, we say, Lord, why are you treating me like this? But this tells me that one day when I look back on it, I can see why God took something away. Why God removed something from my life. I can see that it's for my good. And I'll say, thank you, Jesus, for knowing better than me. Thank you, Jesus, for taking something that I didn't need and replacing it with something better. Paul even says it this way. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Are you going through something today? Are you going through stuff? Can I encourage you this today? When God sends you through stuff, it's because He has something better for you on the other side. When God takes something away, when God puts something in your life, remember, brothers and sisters, God has something better in mind for you and me. Something better. God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart for us, 
when you're discouraged, when you're when you're hanging on to God with with your fingertips, with your fingernails. Some of you might have just come to church today saying, I'm not going to this is my last chance. If I don't meet something, if I don't meet God here today, if I don't have an experience with God, I'm, I'm going to write him off. Brothers and sisters, let me encourage you. God has something better for you. The Bible says all these died in faith. It's our job to live in faith. It's our job to live in faith, to trust that God has something better for each one of us. Do you believe that today? Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You for providing something better for us. Lord, this world offers us shiny things that are worthless. But You hold out Your hands of love and You invite us to come unto you all that labor and are heavy laden and you will give us rest. Oh Lord, we love that beautiful promise. We love that how grace-filled and how merciful and how patient and how forgiving you are. Forgive us, Lord, for, for, for doubting you. Forgive us for complaining. Lord, help us to enjoy that the grace and the mercy and the love that flow from your heart. On a, on a daily basis, on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. And Lord, help us to just open our hearts and our minds to receive all that You are willing to give us if we will just trust You. Lord, help us to remember that there is something better coming. Something better. Something better than this world. And that's Jesus. Lord Jesus, please. Come into this place. Come into our hearts. Make us sanctuaries like, like we sang. Dwell in us. Live in us. Fill us, Lord, with hope for something better. We ask in the wonderful, powerful name of Jesus. Amen.